We're considering the uh, outbreak of the Peloponnesian War. Uh, the last thing we were talking about was the uh, alliance that was made between Athens and Corsaira uh, and the, uh, the significance of the difficult decision the Athenians had to make, which you will recall, was neither to accept the uh, offer of the Corsarians of the traditional offensive and defensive alliance, uh, nor to reject it, but rather to make uh, a different kind of alliance than any we know of before in Greek history, a purely defensive alliance, which I suggest to you <coughs> really should be understood less as a military action than as a diplomatic gesture, as a diplomatic signal. If the, Thus if the Pericles I have in my mind has anything to do with the real Pericles who existed, he is, a, he is a man who is very sophisticated about the idea of sending diplomatic signals by action rather than merely by words, and that his intention here was to uh, avoid the unacceptable change in the balance of naval power, which would have occurred if the Corsarians had been defeated by the Corinthians, at the same time as to try to avoid blowing this whole thing up into a major war against the Peloponnesians by preventing the fighting. In fact, I don't know if I said this flat out, but let me say it now. I think he hoped that when the Corinthians approached Corsaira and saw Athenian ships lined up with the Corsarians, the Corinthians would back off and there would be no battle and the result would be some other way of getting out of this crisis. As it turned out, uh, his hopes were dashed. At the Battle of Sabota, which took place in September 433, to which the Athenians, you remember, sent 10 ships with uh, three generals, one of whom, the leading one, was Lacedaemonius, the son of Cimon, who received orders that were the most difficult kinds of orders you can imagine giving uh, a naval commander. His orders were to stay there uh, and if the battle commenced, not to engage in that battle unless and until that moment when it appeared that the Corinthians were not only going to win, but were going to land on the island of Corsaira. Then and only then should Lacedaemonius bring the Athenian ships into uh, combat. Now, how in the world, in a naval battle especially, where things don't stand still, <laughs> they're either moving around themselves or the sea is moving them around, how can you be sure what's, ha what's going to happen 10 minutes from now, half an hour from now? It's impossible to be certain, so it would have been a difficult call, and I do think that uh, Pericles anticipated that it, there might be an engagement which uh, he would want to uh, regret, but he could blame Lacedaemonius and the generals for <coughs> doing it. However that may be, um, that's all that the Athenians sent. And again, we, we ought to realize the Athenians had 400 triremes. They could have sent a couple of hundred, which would have guaranteed that if the Corinthians had fought the Corinthians would have been swept from the sea. Why didn't he do that? It was obvious again that his intention was not to frighten or anger the Spartans, the head of the Peloponnesian League, by such a crushing victory, but instead to employ the technique of deterrence. <coughs> now, the decision to send only 10 was debatable after those 10 had been sent, the question was raised again in the Athenian assembly, obviously by people who didn't agree with Pericles' approach, who insisted that there should be a larger fleet sent. And Pericles apparently could not prevent them sending some more ships, but the most they could get a vote for was 20 more ships. So now there's a second Athenian detachment that uh, is sent some days after the first, which is, uh, consists of 20 ships more. Keep that in mind. Well, the battle, which Thucydides describes in, uh, in great detail, <coughs> uh, works as follows. The Corinthians 
do attack uh, against the uh, combined forces of uh, 120, is it? 100 and 110 uh, Corsarian ships and 10 Athenians that are there with their 150, and the Corinthians are winning. And at a critical moment, <coughs> Lacedaemonius <coughs> engages the Athenians in the fight, and so what Pericles hoped to avoid took place. And the Corinthians would have succeeded in winning the battle and would have landed on the island and presumably ultimately taken charge of the Corinth uh, Corsarian fleet when something happened that, uh, if it wasn't the, the very stern and factually determined Thucydides, but it was a Hollywood movie, you wouldn't believe it. <clears throat> Namely, as all of this is happening, you can imagine somebody <clears throat> on one of the uh, Corinthian ships suddenly looking behind and looking on the horizon and seeing ships coming, and then seeing that they were Athenian ships, at which point the Corinthians panicked, pulled back, gave up their victory, and withdrew from the fight. You can't blame the Corinthians. Once they knew they were Athenian ships, they had every reason to think, my God, maybe there's 200 Athenian ships coming at us. And so uh, it turned out, of course, there were only 20, but it was too late. And so the Battle of Sibota, this, this, land, this naval battle I've described to you, ends in this way, and it leaves things up in the air. <clears throat> the Corinthians are, have not been deterred. They are determined more than ever to continue the fight. And on the other hand, the uh, Corsarians aren't backing down either. And so here we have <coughs> one of the issues that will be decisive in bringing on the war. <coughs> Over that winter, 433 to 432, two events of importance in this connection take place. We cannot be sure <coughs> precisely when in that year they took place, and we can't even be sure which of them came first. <coughs> I, I'm uh, in, in tur turning first to Potidea. Um, I'm doing what most scholars do, but it, none of us have any reason to believe it happened before the next thing I'll tell you about. City of Potidea, up in the Chalcidic Peninsula, those three, thre three fingers <laughs> sticking out into the Aegean from Thrace, uh, was, you will perhaps recall, a Corinthian colony and it was uh, extraordinarily close to Corinth. Remember when I was talking about colonies and the varieties of relations with the mother city that they had, I told you that Potidea had unusually close relations with Corinth. Each year, the Corinthians sent out magistrates who in fact governed Potidea, and this was uh, voluntary on the Potidean's part. So you have a very special Corinthian Potidean thing. Because of what, what had happened and what was happening, <coughs> uh, the Athenians feared, and it turned out rightly feared, that the Potidaeans might be planning to rebel against them uh, and to join their Corinthian friends. <coughs> in fact, the, Corinth the uh, Potidaeans were planning such a thing, and uh, in order to make their chances greater, they secretly sent a mission to Sparta <coughs> in which they asked the Spartans, <coughs> just as you remember the Thasians had done back there in 465. <coughs> if we rebel, <coughs> will you invade Attica? And I assume it was the ephors, this was a secret thing, it would not have been discussed in the Spartan assembly. <coughs> I believe a majority of the ephors must have said, we will. And so the Potidaeans went forward with their rebellion. The Athenians, before the rebellion broke out, but suspecting such things as being uh, in the cards, sent a fleet. There was a fleet of Athenian ships that was going to Macedonia anyway <coughs> for other reasons, and they were instructed by the assembly, <coughs> again, I'm sure it's Pericles calling the shots, <coughs> uh, to stop by at Potidea on the way and when they were in Potidea, to take down the defensive walls that the Potidaeans had on the seaside so that they would be vulnerable to the Athenians without question, which would presumably deter a rebellion. <coughs> but when that fleet went out, they found that the Potidaeans were already in rebellion. They could not uh, 
get at Potidaea, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> the Athenians, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> subsequently sent a fleet to blockade the city and sent an army to blockade it on the land side, <coughs> and they were now at war with Potidaea, uh, the colony of Carnes, <coughs> uh, to suppress the rebellion. The Corinthians responded in an interesting, complicated way. <coughs> a band of, I think the number was 2,000, I think it's 2,000 Corinthian hoplites <coughs> came to Potidaea and helped defend it against the Athenian attackers. <coughs> Thucydides describes them as privately sent, that is to say, uh, they he wants to make the point that these were not sent officially as Corinthian soldiers. They were what, in the we've seen these games being played in the modern world too. Uh, they were volunteers, just like the, uh, the 40,000 Cuban volunteers that went to Angola <coughs> in the 1970s. You know, volunteers uh, paid for, um, supplied, and ordered there by uh, Castro. That's the kind of uh, volunteers I think were in uh, Potidaea at this point. <clears throat> Why did the Corinthians go through this uh, masquerade, this uh, very easily penetrated masquerade? Because they knew that the Athenians under the treaty had every right to suppress a rebellion <clears throat> in their empire, but they didn't want it to happen. If they had officially sent their own forces to help, they would have been guilty of aggression. They would have been guilty of breaking the treaty by uh, interfering in the other fellow's zone. And that would have had a very bad effect on what the Corinthians were clearly deeply concerned about now. <coughs> Getting the Spartans to get the Peloponnesian League <coughs> into the war against Athens to achieve the goals that Corinth wanted. So that explains that tricky little business. So now, event number two. The Athenians are actually having already fought the Corinthians at sea in the Battle of Sabota, <clears throat> were now engaged in a siege of, city, of a city which contained thousands of Corinthian soldiers as well, and yet <clears throat> nobody had declared war on anybody. This is all happening technically during peacetime. The other important event that took place over that winter <clears throat> uh, had to do with the town of Megara. We've been hearing about that, of course, at least ever since the first Peloponnesian War. <coughs> what happened here was that at a certain point in that winter, the Athenians passed a decree of the assembly which forbade <coughs> the Megarians from trading, uh, let me back up, let me be very technical, from, from using the harbor <coughs> of the Piraeus for, from a, being anywhere, from using the agora of Athens <coughs> or for using any of the ports <coughs> of the empire. I'm being extremely technical and careful about this. If I were not, I'd be simply saying that they were being, barring the uh, Megarian trade from anywhere in the Athenian empire. Uh, I don't do so because one brilliant uh, late Oxford scholar <coughs> uh, came up with a theory about uh, this event in which he tried to say, no, this was not a, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, an embargo, <clears throat> but it was in fact merely a, 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 an attempt to shame, to disgrace the Megarians. Uh, it was when, they, when, he, when they, the, the, the bill says, you may not use the agora of Athens, it means the agora as the civic center. This is, has nothing to do with trade. I just want to mention it <coughs> so that I've done justice. Uh, nobody has believed that theory uh, um, uh, yet, and I don't think they should. <coughs> it's an embargo, and its intention is again, well, let's, why are we doing anything against Megara? <coughs> I think the best explanation is that when the uh, Corinthians had fought the Corsarians in two naval battles, you remember, Leukimne in, in 435, Sibota in 433. <coughs> After the first, in the first one, a number of Peloponnesian allies and other allies too had assisted the Corinthians <coughs> in the battle. 
Now, at the uh, second battle, the number of allies assisting the Corinthians was cut down significantly. In my opinion, that is because the Spartans had made clear that they wished for their allies to stay clear of this conflict, that they didn't want to be dragged <coughs> into a war over it. And I think the evidence for that is that when, you remember that conference that the Corsarians asked for to meet with the Corinthians and see if they couldn't work this out? The Spartans accompanied them to that conference and uh, clearly that means they wanted such a conference to take place and they would have liked <coughs> a peaceful outcome but the Corinthians wouldn't have any. And so uh, I think that it was the, the clear signal that the Spartans gave that we want you to cool this that explains why fewer Peloponnesian allies showed up to help at the second battle. But among those few <coughs> were the Megarians. Why? Because we know the Megarians had a terrific grudge against the Athenians, <coughs> of course, throughout all of history. But more to the point, at the end of the First Peloponnesian War, when the Megarians had rebelled against the Athenians <coughs> in their moment of greatest danger, <coughs> and then had slaughtered, uh, as they had, a, an Athenian garrison <coughs> at the port, <coughs> there was tremendous ill will between the two cities. And uh, the Megarians were just going to take a shot at uh, giving the Athenians a hard time. And so it was important for the Athenians, <coughs> or in any case, led by Pericles, that was the way the assembly decided, not to allow what the Megarians had done to go unpunished <coughs> because they wanted to deter other Peloponnesian allies from doing the same the next time. Well, what could they do? Well, the only thing, there are really two things they could do. <coughs> Come to think of it, before they came up with this idea, there was only one. They could march into Megara <coughs> and fight. <coughs> but of course, that would be an attack directly on an important ally of Sparta it would be a breach of the Thirty Years' Peace. It would bring about a great Peloponnesian War. Pericles didn't want to do that. <coughs> but he didn't want the Megarians to get away scot-free. And so he invented a new thing again, yet one more <coughs> new idea, <coughs> which I again regard as fundamentally a diplomatic device meant to uh, deter <coughs> the kind of behavior that was necessary to deter. And that was this De decree. And scholars have fought forever and a day about all aspects of it, and most importantly about what it's for, why it's going on, what, what's its purpose. And uh, unless you understand it as I'm suggesting you should, it really is hard to tell. Because it could not have done, driven the, the Megarians, <coughs> excuse me, out of the Peloponnesian League over to the Athenian side, as it did not. Megarians are absolutely determined, remain terribly hostile. Nothing, no matter how much they suffered, could make them change sides. This was an oligarchic, pro-Spartan outfit that ran the place and hated the Athenians terribly. <coughs> Pericles had to know that. He wasn't trying to uh, wipe them out. He wasn't trying to take them out of business. He was trying to show, not so much them, but other Spartan allies, that it the Athenians could hurt them <coughs> in ways that they had not been hurt before without going to war and dragging the Spartans in. Any commercial Greek state in the Peloponnesus, and most of them <coughs> had to do some kind of commerce, and some of the most important ones were right on the seashore, would have had to understand what the significance of this was. <coughs> so there, we have the Megarian Decree, <coughs> and it is the third of these uh, pro provocations, as the Corinthians saw it, that helped to bring on the war. We would use such terms as the immediate causes, <coughs> the complaints, of the, um, the official complaints, as uh, Thucydides would speak of them, which uh, are seen or were seen by contemporaries as being the causes of the war. <coughs> And it's important to recognize that Thucydides' whole work, or at least certainly book one, is dedicated to correcting what he thinks is an error about these things. In his view, it's not these particularities <coughs> that matter. It's the truest cause, that is, 
the growing power of Athens and the fear <coughs> that it engendered among the Spartans. And uh, that's what that's all about. Well, the Corinthians, in reaction to these events, Corsaira, <coughs> Potidea, Megara, pressed the Spartans to take action, pressed them to call a meeting uh, at, at which point, uh, which would allow the allies to make their complaints to the Spartans. And of course, that wouldn't have had any success if there had not been Spartans <coughs> who themselves had been decided that war against Athens was desirable and were prepared, they would, be, they would have had to be influential Spartans who thought that, members of the Gerousia, Ephors, possibly kings. We know at least one <coughs> Spartan king was not in favor of it. In fact, and the other Spartan king was in exile. <coughs> so this could not have been led by kings, but rather by the other two groups of people. But it's also clear that the majority of Spartans were not convinced <coughs> because they would not have needed to do what they did if that had been true. They called a meeting of the Spartan assembly to which they invited all states that had any grievance against the Athenians. And of course, you can see that the magistrates clearly wanted to stir the people to war, but they were not <coughs> capable of delivering a majority. And so the assembly takes place. <coughs> uh, and uh, I hope you read that section very, very carefully. The Corinthians make the decisive speech. Uh, the essence of it is, some of it is just sophistry, but some of it is to make the case, let's not worry about all these technicalities. Well, well they might not worry about those technicalities. <coughs> None of those technicalities amounted to a breach of the 30 years peace. They were asking the Spartans to violate their oaths by launching a war <coughs> uh, that violated their previous commitments. And the late, uh, later in the war, the Spartans themselves admitted that they were troubled by the fact that they had been guilty of such a breach. So <coughs> what the Corinthians was, were asking uh, was very, very difficult. And, um, it, and because they, so they, when, whenever they talked about the particularities, they wanted to get past them as fast as they could because they didn't work for them. Instead, they brought in a larger issue that was much harder to defeat. It was a statement about the Athenian character, the kind of people that the Athenians were. Sort of all tied up in a phrase that the Corinthians used, something like the Athenians were born neither to live themselves in peace nor to allow their neighbors to live in peace. He painted a hor they painted a horrible picture of a people who, uh, of a state which was insatiable, so ambitious that it would always be a menace <coughs> to all its neighbors. No sense worrying about the details at any particular moment. They were growing stronger and stronger and stronger, and it was only a matter of time until they fell upon their neighbors and uh, destroyed their freedom. The Athenians sent ambassadors to Sparta. They had not been invited. <coughs> they were there, says Thucydides mysteriously, on other business. I always wonder, what other business could they have had? Were they, were they negotiating a, uh, a grain treaty? Was it... Uh, in exchange for uh, violinists and uh, piano players? I mean, what in the world? I, I don't know, because, of course, I think that was a cover story. <coughs> they were there with instructions. And the instructions were, go to that meeting. Listen, if you think that it's important to do so, I want you to make the following set of statements to the Spartans. And so we have a speech delivered by the Athenians after all the other allies had complained about this, that, and the other thing. And uh, <coughs> the uh, essence of the Athenian speech, I think, was, first of all, they did what they could <coughs> to make a case for themselves, but the heart and soul of what they said was this. It came sort of at the end of their speech, which was, don't imagine <coughs> that if you go to war against us, this is going to be an easy war for you. <coughs> In effect, they were suggesting what was true. We are a different kind of state. <coughs> the Corinthians say we are a different kind of state in one sense, but we're telling you we're a different kind of state in another sense. 
We don't need to do what your defeated opponents regularly have to do. That is to try to get out and fight you in a hoplite battle. <clears throat> because of our navy, our walls, our money, our empire, we don't need to fight you on the land at all. And we own the sea. You cannot hurt us. So you'll be damn fools to take us on. Don't think you're going to win this war or that it's going to be quick and easy. That part of the speech was meant to deter the Spartan. It has confused scholars who, uh, like so many people, think that if you want to avoid war, what you need to do is to be very nice to the other fellow. Uh, there's no guarantee of that one way or the other. <coughs> but the, but the, the, the other side of the Athenian argument is very important, too. They said, on the other hand, whatever grievances you or your allies have against us, and that would have included <coughs> all of these things I've mentioned to you, we are prepared to submit to arbitration as the treaty requires. In effect, if you want to keep your oaths, you must not attack us. You must submit all complaints to arbitration. <coughs> the Athenians, and again, I'm sure this was <coughs> orchestrated entirely by Pericles, <coughs> hoped that this combination of approaches <coughs> would get the Spartans to back off <coughs> and uh, allow the situation to cool down. The, uh, uh, Thucydides records two speeches made by Spartans at that assembly, <coughs> one by King Archidamus, who was a personal friend of Pericles, we learn from other sources, <coughs> and who clearly, from what he says uh, here, would not, does not want to go to war now, <coughs> and I would suggest doesn't want to go to war at any time at all. <coughs> and he makes a case against the Corinthian argument <coughs> and arguing for delaying going to war if to go, one goes to war at all, and he hoped to put the matter off for several years. That he had to do, I think, because he recognized that the speech of the Corinthians <coughs> had changed the mood in Sparta, and he thought that if the Spartans simply voted for on, on the question of war now, they would vote for it. So he couldn't just say, let's not go to war. <coughs> he felt all he could say was, it's, this is not the time. Let's wait several years, we need money, we need to calculate all that kind of stuff. And so that was the argument uh, that he made. And he, he backed up the Athenian argument essentially saying, this is not gonna be a quick, easy war of the kind we're accustomed to. If you go to war now, and this is another memorable phrase that he employed, you will leave this war to your sons. <coughs> that means he's saying this is gonna take a generation to fight. That was his argument. Then on comes the, the uh, ephor, who is the, uh, the president of the meeting on that day. His name is Sthenaleidas. And he gives a wonderfully short, Spartan, laconic speech. He says, I've heard a lot of long speeches, most of which I don't understand. I'm just a simple Spartan, is what he's uh, implying, unlike these con men, unlike these sophists that you've been listening to. Uh, what I know is these guys are now laying hands on our allies. And he was talking mainly about the Megarian decree. <coughs> um, and so uh, the only question is, are we going to let them do that or not? And I say, let's not. And then he called for the vote. And uh, interesting thing happens there, too. After, you know how the Spartans vote, they bang on their shields and they yell. You know, so those in favor, those who believe the Athenians have broken the treaty, that's the way the, f the thing was put to them, indicate in the usual way, and they'll go blah, 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 blah. And uh, those who think not, same noise. And then he said, I, I really couldn't tell which side was the louder. Uh, so let's have a division and count, which was unusual, very unusual in the Spartan assembly, at which time he found a very large majority in favor of the war. You know, I've gone on both ways on the question of what did he hear and what didn't he hear the first time, and so I still don't know for sure what happened. I mean, one interpretation is <coughs> he really couldn't tell. It was very close. Well, why wasn't it close on the division? Because in a place like Sparta, you don't want to show yourself as being against war when other guys are in favor of it. That's not what brave men and Spartans do even though you think that would be a good idea. 
The other possibility <coughs> is he knew right away there was a majority, and a clear majority for war, but he wanted everybody else to see how big that majority was. I don't know what I think. I think I wrote in one book one thing, in another book another thing. <laughs> <coughs> um, and so, the Spartans voted that the Athenians had broken the peace and the implication was <coughs> we should go to war. That took place at a meeting in Sparta probably in July of 432, uh, but the war doesn't start, or let me back up, the Spartans don't go marching into Attica to fight the Athenians until probably March of 431. <coughs> Why did it take so long for the Spartans to fulfill what they had just voted for? There's no really good reason why they couldn't begin immediately. Some scholars point out <coughs> July is too late to cut down the grain in Athens, which would already have been harvested and put away. Fine, but that's not all the Spartans have to do in Athens. It's one of the things they do is to go out into the farms, burn farmhouses, destroy as many olive trees as they can, cut down as many grapevines as they can. All of that can be done <coughs> in July and August and September just as well as it can be done at any other time. So I don't think <coughs> that's a good reason. I think what happened was that the heat that had been uh, stoked up by the Corinthian argument and those of they're allies. We only have the Corinthian speech, but you can bet the Megarians and the Potidaeans and the, laid on a pretty hot uh, set of complaints as well. So did the island of Aegina. So uh, it was in the heat of anger that the Spartans voted. It must be, I think, that when they had a chance to think it over, they thought that maybe Archidamus knew what he was talking about uh, and they'd better think again. So. There is time in this stretch of what is it, about nine months for the negotiations that did indeed follow. Missions were sent <coughs> from Sparta to Athens to try, well, we shall see, to try to do what. <coughs> they, uh, the first mission uh, sent to Athens made the demand that there need be no war if the Athenians would simply drive out the curse. Well, we know what that is, the curse of the Alcmeonidae. Well, what Alcmeonidae are we talking about? Pericles' mother is an Alcmeonid. He's the only prominent Alcmeonid around. This is an attempt to, you could think of to get Pericles out of there. You guys don't want war? Just get rid of Pericles. Well, they knew the Athenians weren't going to do that. <laughs> The idea we are engaged here in psychological warfare to undermine Pericles, who they see rightly as the driving force behind the Athenian policies, and they want to make his political situation more uncomfortable and cause him trouble. The Athenians basically say, take a walk, and that's the first mission. <coughs> Next, the Spartans send a mission which in my view, so the first one, I, as I say, was not a serious effort at avoiding the war, but the second one in my view was. <coughs> this second mission said to the Athenians, we want you to uh, withdraw your troops from Potidaea. We want you to leave Aegina autonomous as you're supposed to. And we want you to withdraw the Megarian decree. In fact, if you will only withdraw the Megarian decree, <coughs> there will be no war. That really changed the situation. <coughs> because now in Athens, the issue could be boiled down by the opponents of the war. <coughs> and Thucydides lets us see that there was strong opposition <coughs> to going to war on the part of some that why in the world are we going to war about this embargo we have laid on the Megarians? <coughs> Who cares about that? And so in the, the great final debate about this issue, what should we do, how should we answer the Spartan offer on this occasion? <coughs> Many speeches were made, Thucydides tells us, <coughs> but the only one he reports is that of Pericles. <coughs> and Pericles makes the case as to why it is necessary not to withdraw the Megarian decree. And it is 
The classic argument <clears throat> against appeasement out of fear. If we do withdraw this, we will do so only because we're afraid <clears throat> that the Spartans will attack us <clears throat> and we're afraid to fight them. Now, if we give way on this point, why should the Spartans ever do anything but threaten us again when they want something that we don't want to do? We will be under their power. You cannot give way to that kind of a menace and still maintain a free hand or any level of equality with the uh, potential opponent. <coughs> that, I think, was the essence <coughs> of what he had to say, <coughs> along with reminding the Athenians <coughs> how wrong the Spartans were and how uh, inappropriate was their behavior, because he said, remember, I have, uh, we have <coughs> offered to submit every complaint that they have to arbitration. They refused to do that. How can we, uh, in all honor and in all sense of security, <coughs> uh, refuse to resist that kind of behavior? And he won the day. The Athenians refused <coughs> to withdraw the Megarian decree. The, uh, the course of war was uh, clearly set. But you know, even then, it was months before the war began, and it wasn't the Spartans who began it. It all began when the Thebans, early or late in winter, I guess, of 431, <coughs> made a sneak attack <coughs> on the Boeotian town of Plataea, which was allied to Athens. Why did they do it? Either, scholars suggest one of two possibilities, either <coughs> because they knew that there was going to be a war and they wanted to gain the strategic advantage <coughs> of having Megara, which, uh, sorry, Plataea, which is close to the Athenian border, in their control, or the flip side could be they were afraid there would not be a war, and they were eager that there should be a war. We just can't be certain about it. But what we can't be certain about it was the attack <coughs> on Plataea led the Plataeans to ask their Athenian allies to help them, the Athenians, at the very least, had to say they would, although in the, in, the, in the fact they did not. And that would compel the Spartans uh, to come in and help their Theban allies. And that is indeed how <coughs> the um, war began. When in probably March of 431, the Spartan and Peloponnesian army, <coughs> we don't know how big, <coughs> but very much bigger than the Athenian army, uh, came marching into uh, Attica and, and the war. Uh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten one thing. Before these, uh, the attack on uh, Plataea, the Spartans sent one more <coughs> mission to Athens in which they said, uh, forget everything we've said before. If you want peace, you must free the Greeks. That was understood to mean you must give up your empire. The Spartans did not for a minute <coughs> uh, um, expect the Athenians to do that. <coughs> this was a way, this was psychological warfare for what was to follow. The Spartans were to fight the war on the program. We are the liberators of the Greeks against these um, uh, imperialistic, aggressive uh, Athenians who are destroying everybody's autonomy and making it impossible for everybody to live comfortably. We are the liberators, and that's what we're doing. So now, uh, we've seen that the uh, Athenians had refused to uh, rescind the decree, and the war uh, had begun. It's worth asking, why did the two sides <coughs> make the decisions they did? The Spartans refused to arbitrate. Why? because their whole system <coughs> depended upon the allies of Sparta being able to count on the Spartans to protect them from a third party when it was necessary. So if the Spartans said, well, we can't, we're not gonna do that, we'll leave it to some arbitrator to take care of, they had to worry <coughs> that the fundamental reason for the League, which gave them their power and their security, uh, would disappear. 
and that would be uh, the end of that. <clears throat> they also had to worry that if they did not do what the Corinthians and the Megarians and others wanted them to do, the Corinthians might leave the league. That is what the Corinthians threatened them with in their speech, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> which itself might be something that would lead to the dissolution of the Peloponnesian League, which is so crucial to Sparta. Um, so that the, all of that was on their minds. Another reason that the Spartans were not prepared to give way was that they really didn't believe, the majority did not believe, what the Athenians said <coughs> about how the war would be fought or about what Archidamus said, which was to back up the Athenian claim. They could say what they want, but there was no instance in a Greek history that, uh, ever in which one state invaded the land of the other state and the other state simply let them do what harm they wanted. No matter what the, the Athenians might say, no matter what uh, you might think that the Athenians had the capacity to do that, they wouldn't do that. And, the, and uh, Spartans could point, what happened the last time we invaded Attica? 445, the Athenians came out and made a, a treaty with us. They, they conceded, they backed off. Why would it be otherwise this time? <clears throat> I think that you, you must always be aware yourself when, you, when you're thinking about the outbreaks of wars anywhere, that one of the powerful issues, one of the things that helps people decide one way or another, is their estimate of how that war will be fought and what the price of that war will be and what the chances of victory are. That's always in your mind. You're much less likely to go to war if you feel very confident you're going to get smashed <coughs> uh, or that the cost of the war will be intolerable and so on. So that was another issue. There is a real link, in other words, between the strategy that the Spartans expected to be able to employ and the policy that went with it. Now, of course, their, their guess, their guess about how the war would be fought turned out to be wrong <coughs> and very costly to them. What else could they have done? Well, in theory at least, they could have called the Corinthian bluff and say, no, we're going to obey our oaths in the previous treaty. We're going to submit to arbitration. Too bad if you don't like it. What could the Corinthians have done? Well, they might have tried to withdraw from the league and their own withdrawal would not have been critical, only if they had been able to bring with them other states. We can only guess as to how successful they might have been. Perhaps it's not out of the question that Megara, being as upset as they were, would have joined them. That would have been a real strategic problem because between the two of them, they control the Isthmus and it means the Spartans can't get out of the Peloponnesus. Uh, so <clears throat> I don't know how much <clears throat> of a choice that really was. On the other hand, I'm sure there must have been Spartans who said, say, who's in charge of this league anyway? The Corinthians are us. We make the policy, they do what we tell them. We don't get dragged around by them. But then the question would be, well, what if, what if these things do happen? So it was, as always, not an easy call <clears throat> for either side. After all, the Spartans always had to fear the Helots. And Thucydides makes the point, I think, that it is fear of the Helots that is always at the core of Spartan policy decisions. Recently, scholars have decided to challenge that, but I don't think they've been very successful with that. Thucydides describes the motives that drive states to war. He gives a wonderful triad, fear, honor, and interest. And in this case, and it's usually some combination of all of these things, in this case all of them were engaged, but I think fear is legitimately the one that's prominent. It's the one that Thucydides puts uh, at the head of the list, and you can see why it might be right. What about Athens? Why did the Athenians behave as they did? Thucydides, uh, Pericles uh, and the Athenians followed this moderate policy of deterrence. They insisted upon the terms of the treaty. They insisted upon their equality with the Spartans and therefore 
on arbitration, no dictation, no appeasement out of fear. The McGarrian decree was intended as a warning and I think Pericles relied on the fact, a very unusual situation, Sparta has only one king at this time, and that king is Archidamus, who is a friend of Pericles and who is in favor of peace. Kings are very influential in Sparta, and so Pericles might well have thought, with Archidamus on my side, <coughs> the Spartans will understand. I have no aggressive attention, intentions against them, I don't want to wreck their league, I don't want to do anything to them, but they will simply have to arbitrate these problems, and they will see that, and he was wrong. <coughs> he was confident, here too, it's the same issue, the question of how does strategy and policy, how do they uh, connect with one another, um, he believed that his strategy could not fail. The Spartans could invade, could do what harm they liked, the Athenians, uh, would be able to live through whatever they did without taking casualties, simply losing property, because they had the empire that they could live off, which would bring them the money they needed to buy everything they wanted, and they had nothing to fear at sea. So, uh, surely the Spartans, after they cooled off, would see that they couldn't win. And then, why fight? Because they just couldn't harm the Athenians. It was a strategy that was totally rational, and that's what was wrong with it. <clears throat> it didn't take account of the irrationalities that govern human beings so much of the time. It didn't take uh, account of the fact that the Spartans were both angry and frightened. And finally, that the Spartans didn't have the imagination, and I, I mean, I, I don't want to put the Spartans down as particularly blind in this respect, Seems to me all Greeks <coughs> would have had the same doubts, didn't have the imagination to think that anybody would do what Pericles had in mind, and even if it was explained to them, they'd say they won't do it. Because to do so from the Spartan and Greek perspective would be cowardly. And would the Athenians be willing to be shown up to be such terrible cowards as they would have to be standing behind their walls, watching the Spartans ripping up their homes, destroying their crops, and calling them every name in the book? Uh, as they shouted beneath their walls. They thought not. <clears throat> and so um, Pericles and the Athenians, I think, went uh, wrong, as the Spartans did, really, in anticipating what was going to happen. Uh, and finally, I would make this point, and make it as a general point uh, about the outbreaks of wars anywhere, anytime, and that is, if you are going to use a strategy of deterrence, you must have available to you a powerful offensive threat. It's one thing to say, as Pericles was in effect saying, you can't hurt me, so don't fight. You have to be able to show the enemy, I can hurt you very badly, so don't fight. And Pericles had no intention of employing anything like a very serious offensive threat. Uh, there were ways he might have been able to do this or that, but that was not what was on his mind. He, he expected that the Spartans would behave fundamentally rationally. They would calculate their chances of victory, they would see they had none, and they would negotiate, which means accept arbitration and get out of this fix. In my view, neither side wanted war, but neither side was ready to yield for the reasons that I have suggested. It's not that this was, uh, in my view, an irrepressible conflict. I use the terminology of the American Civil War <coughs> because really that's what Thucydides is saying about the, the Peloponnesian War, that it was an irrepressible conflict. I think not. I think mistakes were made, mistakes of judgment, uh, on both sides that produced the outcome. Both sides felt that they could not back down. And as Lincoln would say of his great war, and the war came. I don't really think it was the case of one side deciding, let's have a war. I think it was they both stumbled into it as a consequence of the situation and the uh, 
their misunderstandings of what was going on. So, now to turn to the war itself. Uh, I have long ago concluded that running through the war at the pace that's available to me in time will be so too superficial to be anything but silly. So I won't try to tell you what happened in the war, but you have a pretty good informant there. His name is Thucydides. <coughs> and your textbook can uh, fill the rest of it in. What I'd like to do uh, in, in the time available to me to talk about the war is to pursue a couple of topics in some depth <coughs> to help you understand some aspects of the war rather than the uh, hopeless effort to describe the war to you so briefly. <coughs> so I want to talk to you first about the main source that we have for understanding the war and that the great historian who wrote it, Thucydides, in his history of the war. I'd like to, uh, I guess if I, when I, when I give this as a separate talk to people, I r use the title Thucydides, the revisionist historian of the Peloponnesian War. And let me just uh, do that for you. Now just that title ought to raise a number of questions. Who is this guy? Who is this Thucydides? Why should we be interested in what he wrote uh, over 2,400 years ago. Also, what is a revisionist? And how can Thucydides be a revisionist when he seems to have been the first man to write a history of the Peloponnesian War? What was there for him to revise? Well, Thucydides was an Athenian aristocrat who came of age at the height of the greatness of Periclean Athens, he appears to have been born, let us say, about 460 BC. He was not yet 30 when the Great War broke out. With two interruptions, that war lasted for 27 years and left Greece shattered, impoverished, and permanently weakened. Never again were the Greeks masters of their fate. <clears throat> and that war was his subject. But why should a war among the ancient Greeks interest us today? <clears throat> One answer lies in Thucydides' definition of his task and in the skill in which he carried it out. He said, it may well be that my history will seem less easy to read, and he means here less easy to read than Herodotus with all those wonderful, funny stories that he tells, <clears throat> because of the absence in it of a romantic element. Take that, Herodotus. <laughs> it will be enough for me, however, <clears throat> if these words of mine are judged useful for those who want to understand clearly the events that happened in the past and which human nature being what it is, will at some time or other and in much the same ways be repeated in the future. My work is not a piece of writing designed to meet the tastes of an immediate public, like Herodotus is, who read his history out uh, in public readings. My work is a possession forever. Now that may sound immodest, but his <coughs> ex expectation obviously was justified, for his work has lasted and been judged useful to this very day. Perhaps uh, more influential in our time than any time before. But what's a revisionist? In a sense, of course, all historians are revisionists, for each tries to make some contribution that changes our understanding of the past. <clears throat> when we use the term revisionist, we refer to a writer who tries to change the reader's mind in a major way, to provide a new general interpretation, sharply and thoroughly to change our way of looking at the matter. The term seems to have been used first <clears throat> after the First World War. Most people who lived in the Allied nations believed that the Central Powers were responsible for bringing it on and deserved to be punished for it. Soon after the war, some people began to argue that Germany and Austria were no more responsible than Russia, France, and England, and perhaps less. <clears throat> 
Soon, historians, cold revisionists, argued in support of that position. Before long, the uh, new view captured the minds of educated people in England and America. Even some Frenchmen were convinced, and the Bolshevik government of, Fran of Russia did not need convincing of the wickedness of their Tsarist regime. Since then, the phenomenon has been common. A few writers, uh, most notably A.J.P. Taylor, tried to revise the common opinion that held Hitler responsible for the Second World War and had great success for a while. Later, the causes of the Cold War and of the American War in Vietnam underwent similar treatment. These attempts to reverse opinion have had great practical importance. What happened in the past, and even more important, what we think happened, has a powerful influence on the way we respond to our current problems. What historians say happened, and what they say it means, therefore makes a very great difference. Let me just remind you about the controversy about the First World War to illustrate that point. The Americans, and the English in particular, <coughs> came to feel that Germany was wrongly blamed and therefore unjustly treated by the Versailles Treaty. Americans used this as the main justification for rejecting that treaty and then retreating into isolation from foreign affairs. The English, of course, couldn't go that far, but their belief that Germany was falsely accused made it easy to permit and to justify Hitler's violations of the treaty. Feelings of guilt helped support a policy of disarmament, unpreparedness, and appeasement. The English poet W.H. Auden, responding to Hitler's invasion of Poland in a, a poem called September 1st, 1939, uh, a poem that was subsequently deleted from collections of his poetry, revealed how deeply the idea had penetrated and how late, in spite of everything, it lasted. <clears throat> Here's what he says. Accurate scholarship can unearth the whole offense from Luther until now that has driven a culture mad. Find what occurred at Linz, what huge imago made a psychopathic god. I and the public know what all school children learn. Those to whom evil is done do evil in return. So we ought to understand Hitler and Nazi Germany as simply responding to the bad deal they got at the Battle of Versailles, and that's all there is to it. More recent scholarship has shown to most people's satisfaction that the opinions of contemporaries were more right than the revisionists, that the general blame for the First World War can be laid at Germany's door, and that guilty feelings were unjustified. But it's too late. The revisionist historians did their work so well, and it fits so nicely into the climate of opinion of the 1920s and 30s, that these people captured the minds of a generation and helped to move them in a direction that they wanted to go. So what historians write and what teachers teach can really matter, mostly in the negative. I mean, if we teach you anything right, you forget it. But if we get it wrong, you remember it. <laughs> Thucydides, <clears throat> as much as anyone who has ever written, believed in the practical importance of history. So we should expect him to be eager to set straight any errors of fact or interpretation that he found. <clears throat> but his revisionist uh, tendencies are clear on a larger scale than detail. He has the evidence of Homer, for instance, to show, he uses it, that it was the poverty of the Greeks, not the bravery of the Trojans, that made the siege of Troy so long. He seems to have been the first one to present the view that the Peloponnesian War was one single conflict that began in 431 and ended in 427, not a series of separate wars. But my question again is, what was there to revise? <clears throat> the answer, I think, is the same as in the modern instances I mentioned. The not yet fully formed or written opinions of contemporaries. <clears throat> In modern times, these are very easy to recover. Some of us still remember them, and in any case, modern revisionists always confront and argue against them. Thucydides' method is different.
He argues with no one, and he presents the alternative view, uh, I'm sorry, he invents no alternative view <coughs> even to refute it. There are a couple of uh, exceptions, but even then he doesn't mention any body who holds the view he's going to refute, he just puts forward the view. <coughs> he gives the reader only the necessary facts and conclusions that he has distilled from them <coughs> after careful investigation and thought. He has been so successful that for more than 2,400 years, few readers have been aware that any other opinion existed. <coughs> but a careful reading of Thucydides himself and of a few other ancient sources shows that there were other opinions in Thucydides' time and that his history is a powerful and effective polemic against them. One interesting dispute involved the causes of and responsibility for the war, which I've been chatting about. <coughs> to the ordinary contemporary, the war must have seemed the result of a series of incidents beginning about 436 BC <coughs> at Epidamnus. There, a civil war brought about the conflict with Corsaira, the quarrel threatened the general peace when Athens made an alliance, uh, uh, I'm sorry, with Corsaira against Sparta's Corinthian ally. During the winter, Potidaea, I'm not going to go through that because you know all about it. <coughs> the opposition to the war, I remind you, focused on the Megarian decree as its cause and held Pericles responsible for both the decree and the war. <coughs> In 425, the comic poet Aristophanes presented a play called Acarnians. The war had by that time dragged on for six long and painful years, and his comic hero, Dicaeopolis, has decided to make a separate peace for himself. This so angers the patriotic and bellicose chorus that the hero is forced to explain that it was not the Spartans who began the war. Here's what Dicaeopolis says. Some vice-ridden wretches, men of no honor, false men, not even real citizens, they kept denouncing Megara's little coats. And if everyone, anyone ever saw a cucumber, a hare, a suckling pig, a clove of garlic, or a lump of salt, all were denounced as Megarian and confiscated. Then he goes on, some drunken Athenians stole a Megarian woman. <clears throat> and in return, some Megarians stole three prostitutes from the house of Aspasia, Pericles' mistress. Next, the infuriated Pericles, I quote again, <clears throat> enacted laws which sounded like drinking songs that the Megarians must leave our land, our market, our sea, our continent. <clears throat> then, when the Megarians were slowly starving, they begged the Spartans to get the law of the three harlots withdrawn. We refused, though they asked us often. And from that came the clash of shields. Now, using the evidence of Athenian comedy to understand contemporary politics is a tricky business. Just imagine the trouble somebody 2,000 years from now <clears throat> would have making sense of a Jay Leno monologue or a skit from Saturday Night Live. <clears throat> Aristophanes is clearly having fun by connecting the Megarian decree, which we know was supported by Pericles, with the rape of women, which according to Homer started the Trojan War and according to Herodotus, was said to have caused the war between the Greeks and the Persians as well. Still, he does make the Megarian decree and the Athenian refusal to withdraw it central to the coming of the war, both in Acarnians and in another comedy, another comedy he wrote called Peace, performed in 421. In the latter play, he makes Hermes, the god, explain to the war-weary Athenian farmers how peace was lost in the first place. I quote, the beginning of our trouble was the disgrace of Phidias. He's referring to the great sculptor uh, who had been uh, charged with impiety in connection with 
uh, the great statue of Athena that he had constructed for the Parthenon. Then Pericles, fearing he might share in the misfortune, because Phidias was his close friend, dreading your ill nature, that is the Athenians, and your stubborn ways, before he could suffer harm, set the city aflame with that little spark, the Megarian decree. Well, the full context reveals that the connection between the attacks on the great sculptor Phidias, Pericles' friend and associate, and the Megarian decree was Aristophanes' own joke. But it was taken seriously by other ancient writers, and it surely reflected charges that were made by real contemporary enemies of Pericles. <clears throat> the hard kernel of opinion central to all this is the common belief that the cause of the war was the Megarian decree and that Pericles was responsible for it. Well, of course, that view at the very most is an oversimplification. <clears throat> and any good historian would have rejected it as a sufficient explanation. Thucydides, in fact, gives it very little attention. He doesn't mention it in its natural place in the narrative. He doesn't give its date. He doesn't tell us the purpose, or he doesn't, and he doesn't tell us how it worked in practice. He does not conceal the fact that the peace was conditional on its withdrawal, or that it became the center of the final debate in Athens. His way of refuting the common opinion was to indicate its unimportance I, uh, by the small place it occupies in his account, and to include it among all the specific quarrels that he regards as insignificant. His own explicit interpretation is a sweeping revision of the usual explanation, and it's the one I've told you about before. And he states that same explanation, in other words, twice more in his account of the war's origins, and the whole first book is a carefully organized <coughs> unit meant to support that interpretation. And so skillfully and powerfully did he work <coughs> that his interpretation <coughs> has convinced all but a few readers <coughs> over the centuries. Uh, I should point out that uh, in spite of my uh, clearing up that error, it's been available for about 40 years now, I hate to tell you, but most people still agree with Thucydides and not with me. <coughs> the revisionist view quickly and lastingly became orthodoxy. <clears throat> Another controversy surrounds Pericles' most unusual strategy for waging the war, and I'll uh, talk to you about that next time. So let me uh, move on to the next point. Just give me a second. Here we go. Okay. Sorry about this. The point I want to make, <clears throat> in any case, the, the other instance that I want to bring to your attention is in uh, the summary that Thucydides makes <clears throat> of Pericles' career and of his importance to Athens in chapter 65 of book two, after Pericles' death. He interrupts the narrative to give this really lengthy evaluation. <coughs> One of the things he says <coughs> in that ev evaluation is that Athens in the time of Pericles <coughs> was a democracy in name, but the rule of the first citizen in fact. That is a remarkably powerful statement. He is saying that <coughs> uh, Pericles in Athens was not a democracy and that it was uh, in effect some kind of an <coughs> autocratic government with Pericles as the autocrat. Um, I would say that 
all the evidence we have suggests that that is not <coughs> accurate. Uh, just a few points to illustrate why that is so. I mean, one way to do that, I think, is by comparison. People have suggested what, that what Thucydides is saying <coughs> is like what Augustus, the emperor of Rome, said about himself, uh, that he ruled not by any particular power, not by potestas, but by his <coughs> auctoritas, that is to say, that by, by the influence that his persona and his achievements and all those things had over his fellow citizens. Well, in the case of Augustus, it was a flat lie. Augustus had a monopoly of all the armed force there was in the Mediterranean. He also had a vast treasury that he could use for his own purposes. He was, as all historians in the modern world make perfectly clear, he was an emperor who ruled. <coughs> it, was, it was, no matter what instruments he used, it was a one-man rule. And in a second, you can see how it doesn't apply to Pericles. <coughs> Pericles had no armed forces available to him. He could not enforce anything by uh, pulling out some soldiers to do anything that he wanted to do. Anything, any use of any armed forces always had to be voted by the assembly and debated and discussed and a majority determined whether it could be done. Moreover, every month the question was raised, as you know, uh, is Pericles, like the other generals, okay or has he violated anything? Charges could be brought against him, he could be uh, <coughs> brought to, to, to court. And that's what happened to him in the middle of the war in 430. His enemies did bring him, uh, did bring charges against him. He was convicted, he was removed temporarily from the uh, generalship, and he had to pay a very, very heavy fine. This is not the business of dictators. So, very briefly, Thucydides is wrong about that. Why did he want to say that? <coughs> and this gets to my own explanation of how we can understand. I, I've made the, uh, the argument that he's wrong about the origins of war. <coughs> next time I'll make the case of the war, next time I'll make the case that he was wrong in fully supporting St Pericles' strategy in the Peloponnesian War as the correct one. I'll make the, the claim that the opposite is true. If, if I'm right, why in the world did he say the things he did? And I think we need to understand his situation. In 424, he was a general <coughs> commanding Athenian force, naval forces in the north. He was uh, away from the place where they expected him to be when there was a, a suddenly surprised seizure of the important Athenian city of Amphipolis. A charge was brought against him. He was brought to trial and he was found guilty and sent into exile. He spent the last 20 years of the war in exile. <coughs> Probably, I would guess, among fellow exiles and fellow uh, opponents of the Athenian democracy, because he is very clearly a critic of the Athenian democracy. And there he had to speak all the time to people who said, wait a minute, Thucydides, let me get this right. You think Pericles was a terrific guy, don't you? Yeah, I do. He would have had to say that. <coughs> he and, uh, he and they said, besides, didn't you get elected general in 424? And wasn't that about the most radical year in the entire history of Athenian democracy? Weren't you a great pal? How could it be a blue blood like you who knows what nonsense democracy is? How could you possibly hold those positions? And in my view, his history is his answer to those questions. You think that the war is about the Megarian decree and that Pericles is responsible for it? You're completely wrong. The war was inevitable and became so as soon as the Athenian Empire came on board to challenge <coughs> the uh, uh, Spartan hegemony. Uh, your view is naive and ignorant, so please pay attention to my history when I get it fully written. Uh, you think that Pericles was a Democrat, you bloody fool? He was a man who ruled over others. He did not take his orders from the assembly. What's my, oh yeah, you think that uh, we lost the war because we had a bad strategy? The truth is the strategy was right. And if his successors had not abandoned that, 
they would have held out and won the war. And so you see, all of your main ideas about what's happened to us in the past are wrong, and that is why I did what I did, and I was right to do so every step of the way. <clears throat> that was, his history, in my view, was not merely an account of the past, it was an apologia pro vita sua, a defense of his own life and of the great decisions that were made in it. And of course, what I've just said is highly controversial. Next time we'll talk about the strategy in the war. <laughs>